It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Peter Serafinowicz has had a very varied career in entertainment. As an actor, he's been on a bunch of British TV shows, Spaced, I'm Alan Partridge, The IT Crowd. He did the voice of Darth Maul in the Star Wars movie The Phantom Menace. He's also a pretty amazing writer and director. Together with Robert Popper, he created Look Around You. It is a bizarre, hilarious, incredibly specific homage to those boring educational documentaries that kids watch in school. So, is calcium soluble? Look closely before making your decision. Have you observed the chalky deposit at the base of the beaker? If you have, then you'll have reached the conclusion that, no, calcium is insoluble. There is a reason for this. Can you work out what it is? Correct. If calcium were soluble, then our teeth would be open to corrosion through daily contact with saliva. Man would be unable to process foods. Now, Peter has a lead role. He's starring in the Amazon show, The Tick. He plays The Tick. If you haven't seen The Tick, some background, it's a superhero story. It was originally a comic book, then it was a cartoon, then it was a live-action show on Fox in the early 2000s, that one with the great Patrick Warburton in the lead. The Tick is a really strange superhero. He is a giant muscle man in a blue suit that has antennas on the head. He has super strength, and it's almost impossible to hurt him, but he's kind of dumb, and he's quite a bumbler. His sidekick is an accountant named Arthur, and he's the only one who can really keep him grounded. Let's take a listen to a little bit from the new series. This scene features Arthur, played by Griffin Newman, and as we're about to hear, Arthur has just woken up to find the tick in bed with him. You're real? Don't get stuck on trivia, man. We got a tiger by the tail. So this is your HQ, huh? No, this is my apartment. This your secret trigger? Don't touch anything. Whoa, check out the crime lab. It's all thorough and complicated. You've got ideas, theories. I like that in a sidekick. Sidekick? Who's saying anything about sidekick? Don't Perfect. Touch this. You got the brains, I got the everything else. Come on, man, don't you feel it? We're part of a plan that's bigger than the both of us. What are you talking about? I'm a superhero, Arthur. I am nigh invulnerable. I have the reflexes of an Olympic-level jungle cat. I have the strength of 10, perhaps 20 men. A crowded bus stop of men. But my greatest power is this. When destiny speaks, she speaks to me. She says hi, by the way. Peter Serafinovich, welcome back to the show. Hi. It's nice to have you again. It's been quite a long time, like 10 years or something. Yeah, man, it's been ages. Uh, congratulations on the tick. Uh, it's Thanks, man. so funny. Um, I feel like I would never be able to come up with an alternative take on anything that Patrick Warburton had ever done in his career. Right, okay. I, maybe John Lovitz is another example of that. Like, how could you possibly do anything? Yeah. Uh, well, I yeah. I guess I knew him from Seinfeld, but I didn't really know that. Sh I didn't really know him in the show. And then when I when I got the job and I, I spoke to Ben Edlund and he said, um, he said, look, this isn't like a reboot per se. I don't want you. The tick is this character that has lived and gestated in my brain for over 30 years and and uh patrick did a beautiful beloved hilarious version of the tick and i want you to do yours you know so i couldn't help but have a look at a couple of clips it's, it's surprisingly hard to track down online that, well that i show. mean it was hard to track down in the world yeah <laughs> it came and went in a moment uh uh, and I watched about 30 seconds of it and I thought, oh my God, that is so, that is so adorable in like, in that, that, that phrase has a kind of like a, a sort of a weak connotation. And I mean it in its like true sense. It was like, oh God, you just love this guy, you know, and he's heartbreaking. And, and I thought I can't watch anymore because I don't want to be subconsciously influenced by 
his performance because it's just something because I I'm I'm a mimic by nature. It's just something I osmotically do anyway, you know. And uh, yeah, I, I I haven't really seen that much of that much of him. He came in and did the show quite a while ago, maybe six or seven years ago. I was still doing the show out of my house. And he came over to my house, and, you know, here's Patrick Warburton. He's uh, not just the tick. You know, he's from Seinfeld. He was on news radio. He was in a great yeah. movie where he was a used car salesman. And um, and he came over, and he is so profoundly, I guess the word would be Warburton-esque. Right. Uh, like, he's a dad. He's a, sports, he's a sports dad. You know, he uh. just came in. He's like... Yeah, just came over from my uh, my son's football game, you know. Hey, yeah, you know. Right. <laughs> it's like it was the most amazing experience ever, and it. In fact, he was so he was so like that in real life that I wondered if he, I wonder if he just accidentally figured out what was funny about the way that he is, you know. <laughs> yeah, I I I wonder that about. <laughs> people in general you know I, I i know there are things about me that i know that are i do intending to be funny but i know there are things that i certainly my wife knows things about me can see things about me that i will never ever realize that are funny <laughs> that i think are probably pretty cool <laughs> you know i'm actually i'm gonna play uh this is i think this is one of my favorite examples of pure silliness in your oove. Uh, this is this... Oof. Your oove. This is this character that you did... O-O-V-E. Yeah. Oove. I'm not continental like you. Oove um, has become oove. This is a character that you did uh, when you had a sketch TV show and you did, you've done it in some other contexts as well. It's you. You're wearing kind of a... Uh, you're wearing kind of a bodysuit that makes you look like an overweight... 56 year old um the kind of a tired overweight 56 year old with a weird little mustache and a tv presenter's uh manner and this thing is called the butterfield diet and w what we've just heard is him describing impossibly tiny meals that are part of his diet well first of all we've seen him say this is what i used to look like and this is what i look like now and they're exactly the same but then he's eating these absurdly tiny meals, and uh, that's sort of where we pick up. This for breakfast, this for lunch, this for dinner. Saturday is treat day. For 24 hours, you can literally eat anything. Pizza, birthday pie, pints of cream, pork cylinders, potato grids, artificial bacon, large macs. You name it. Sandwich casserole, chocolate quail's eggs, garlic pudding, fluffy ruffs, hoisin crispy owl, pasta pillows, bonbon bonbons, McFortune cookies. It's up to you. Discount foie gras, egg and ham slabs, during dinner mints, mystery meat, quiches Lorraine, 20 cheese omelette. Anything goes. <laughs> this is just, this is just <laughs> you spending a day listing the dumbest food names well, you can think of. All right, let me, uh, I'll see if I can tell you the story of Brian Butterfield, right? Uh, um, because I, I, I think it's, it's weirdly, it's a character that was, I, I had this sketch show that ran for one season, which was like Quiche, seven episodes. Quiche's Louis. <laughs> Large Max. So, uh, During uh, dinner mix. <laughs> um, uh, it was based on, there was, um, there was, a, there was a TV ad for one of those, like a personal injury lawyer. And it was terrible. And the guy looked exactly like Brian Butterfield does in those clips, right? He's like this big, heavy set guy. He's got like a kind of gray crew cut, a, a, a suit that doesn't fit him. But there's something about him that is, that in this in this ad, uh, have you been injured at the workplace? And his, you can see his office behind him, and and his office like looks like untidy, right? And that was the thing when we did. He he has lots of different jobs, different incarnations, and whenever you see his office, it always looks like it's been ransacked, you know. And we saw this ad and and just thought it was so funny. Let's let, let's rip off this guy, and he's such a kind of. I, I don't know. He's such a kind of type. Also, it looked like the guy had said, "Well, um, 
we're going to do an ad for your personal injury uh, service, but um, it's it's going to cost eight hundred pounds. No, I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> I don't need an actor or presenter. I think I can handle that myself. Oh, where's the camera? Um, and uh, he, uh, so it was like clearly this guy was the was the guy who owned the company, you know. Uh, so we started filming this, this, these, these sketches on my sketcher. The first thing was that we did like two whole days of me in this suit, and I, I wear like a lot of latex, and the makeup was was amazing. And um, on the third day, I came in, and this is like a new series, a new crew, and it was all like young camera crew. And people didn't recognize me; they thought the guy that was in. The couple of days before was like another. He was like another guy. I suppose that's a testament to my amazing acting. But anyway, the uh, then the camera assistant said to us, "This is meant to be. This is that guy from the ad, isn't it?" And I said, "Yeah." And she said, "I've worked with him. I know who he is. You work for that that guy who owns the company." He said, "No, no, no. No, he's an actor, right? He's a he's a, he's an actor." So, so that made it even more funny that this guy, <laughs> whoever owns this personal injury thing, picked this actor to represent his company. What I like about it particularly is that I think it has a very uh, you quality to it, which is it is this it is a very finely observed. Performance. You're a gifted impressionist. You know, you have an impressionist's eye for what are the funny details about the way someone is. It's all these different things. And it could be a very straight and probably would be a very funny parody of that kind of lawyer commercial that also exists here in the United States. Yeah. I know exactly the thing you're talking about. But instead what it is is a showcase for a list of 30 funny names for foods that you and your brother thought of. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I think that is something that is that is not unlike what is very funny about The Tick, which is The Tick is not so much about parodying superheroes, although it has the structure of a superhero parody. It's mostly about what is the weirdest phrase that we can come up with that sounds like it could come out of a superhero's mouth. Yeah, I look, I think you're absolutely right. And I think and 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 also I would add that not weird just for the sake of being weird. Weird in like one of my favorite lines is the tick uh, is when I look at Arthur and he's surprised that he survived this fall or whatever and I say Look at you! You're as alive as a daisy. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. why? I, I. It's like, why is that funny? It's like, I it's like slightly changed. <laughs> it's slightly. Your expectation is slightly changed. There's no pun there, no. but like, it's just when someone gets a. I don't even know why it is, but it. And it also sounds like that. Re, it, it. It also sounds like uh, an even more apt phrase than fresh as a daisy to me. Do you know what right. I mean? <laughs> there's, a, there's a part where you keep comparing your sidekick, whose name is Arthur, both in real life and that's also his superhero name, yeah. to like a, you say you're a real like small balloon of hope or something. Uh, precious b balloon of hope, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what is the, what is the, <laughs> yeah. it has it has all the markers of a thing that makes sense and it has a weird sense to it but it's it's a completely it, it's a completely ineffable type of sense that it makes. You couldn't say what makes sense about that except that it does. Yeah. I, that's a very that's a tough thing to that's a tough thing to nail and it's something that you have to nail in your performance as well. Well, it's interesting cuz it, it goes back to that thing of like being Mr. important and spouting out nonsense that everyone just accepts. It's that similar thing of of these words which sound like they're profound or they're commonplace or you know, they mean something even and they don't, you know, but yet they do. You know, which is, uh, I was weirdly going to ask you, I know that you, you've got quite eclectic music taste and you're crazy hip hop person, yeah. right? But also, 
You like other uh, genres of music, yeah? Yeah. I got into... Um, I'm an American, Peter. Uh, I am. <laughs> Oof. Um, <laughs> well, I'm a public radio host, Peter. If I say it all French, people will talk about how pretentious I am. And then if I don't, Sarah Finowich is going to make fun of me. If you like Peter's sketches, why not check out the rest of his oof? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I want to talk to you about your career directing music videos, uh, which has continued to pace these, this past decade. Well, it, it has It stopped, actually. And I, I saw that you tweeted this morning the, uh, the Daft Punk video that I did for get lucky and um i don't think that was an i don't think that was a li officially licensed product uh, right? you know what it wasn't but can uh, you describe what happens in that video for our audience who hasn't seen it people probably know the smash hit daft punk and pharrell song get lucky featuring uh, nile rogers yeah yeah uh so it opens on me and i'm like in a suit and i'm sort of dancing and miming along to the music and then uh, quickly it's revealed that I've got three heads but I, on one body so it's like uh, the middle one is the lead singer and then the two ones either side of the backing singers and they've got slightly different personalities and um, I had the I had the idea to do it because they just released this song. I'd done the Portland Comedy Festival. I was, uh, was on my way back home and I listened to it on the plane. I thought, wow, this is a great song. And uh, I listened to it like a lot on the plane. And then that sort of weird jet laggy, you know, not alive and not dead kind of state. When I got off the plane, I thought, is there a video for that? I want to pitch. The, I've got an idea for the, for the video. And they said, they're not doing a video. They're doing like a little teaser, you know. They do like a little, uh, a little mean little morsel, you know. And and they're not doing a, a proper video. So I said to my producer at the the video production company I, I work for at the time, I said, let's let's. I've got this idea. Let's let's just get some favors and just make it. And it was like the next day, I think, we uh, we made it. And then we uh, we sent it to um, Universal. And so we made this video, <laughs> it, you know, it didn't cost us anything. And um, and then they put it up on their site. And then I got, because uh, uh, I wanted people to think that it was, <laughs> it was like the official video. And I, and I was embracing it as well. I was like, I, I was not like lampooning it because I thought it was a great song, you know, but the best, best, best thing about it was that uh, I sent it to, uh, I tweeted it to Niall Rogers, who's been a lifelong hero of, of mine, and and uh, genuinely magical dude. That oh, guy. Yeah. I mean, one of the ten actual musicians, uh, ma magicians on the earth. One, you know, I think, and he messaged me back the next day saying we're we're, ju we're just being in the studio, we've been recording all day, and then we we just been watching your video in the studio on repeat. <laughs> go, oh, that's great. That's so great. I, I think he was with, he was doing, you know, he works with all kinds of people. I don't know who he's with, but like, I just thought, oh my God, well, you know, you know, things like that are real sort of jewels when they happen, you know? I mean, I feel like, here's the thing that, here's my working theory that I'm going to run past you, Peter. All right. My working theory is, to be a great mimic and impressionist, to do great voices, to do these things that you're undeniably really quite good at is a skill and a discipline. Like there is a there is an element to it of talent. You know, some people are better at it than others. But, you know, the folks who I know who are very good at it, it's because they have focused on it and worked at it in a way that, um, you know, a lot of people in comedy, to the extent that they focused and worked on something, it's often almost accidental, right? It's like a stand-up has to go on stage every night, so they have the discipline of going on stage every night and focusing and working on something. So this is this discipline, and I know some really great impressionists, and some of them 
are really funny, and some of them it's a parlor trick. It depends on how much they also dedicate to the joke part of it. And I feel like I have never known anyone who is so committed both to getting something, getting details of a voice or a thing right, and also doing something as stupid and silly as that list of foods that Brian Butterfield <laughs> lists. Like, there's not even one premise to that list of foods. There's like seven premises. Like, it's they're, they're, each one is funny in a different way. It's not like it builds on, like, there's a rhythm to it, but the, it's not like one of them is the same joke as the other one, but bigger. Um, yeah, I mean, it, and I feel like I, I wonder if you having this gift of and this skill of these voices and these impressions goads you towards this ridiculous silliness in part because ridiculous silliness, that's the purest comedy. Like that is no one can say you're just an impressionist if you're doing as kind of complicated and ridiculous of jokes as you like to do. Uh, talking about like impressions, right? It's like uh, g going about them. First of all, as an actor, right? As an actor, not somebody just immediately kind of, you know, uh, making a face and but doing it as an actor. But also it's like impressionism as in like impressionistic painting is it it's your interpretation of that person so it doesn't have to be like this this replica that a computer couldn't detect that you know it's not that it's how you humans perceive things in different ways than that you know and and we pick up on funny unusual things and you know but 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 going back to as well what you said about like my silliness i mean i've always loved that i've always loved pretending to be an important person pretending to be somebody and then doing something very silly that's my sort of formula for for things you know i had a conversation with mike myers once <clears throat> about i had a, i had a really long conversation with him once about his uh theories about comedy and my god he is like he is quite a scholar of comedy I was writing notes down as I was talking to him, uh, and <laughs> and now I can't remember what he said. What was it? Uh, one of the things he was he was saying that like comedy tends to fall into two main categories. Isn't it funny that? And wouldn't it be funny if? And I think most of mine is like, wouldn't it be funny if? I mean, I think that both sides of those things are related as well, like because they sort of reflect each other, you know, but, uh, but anyway, that was, he was like, he was really like a wise, he has some wise things to say. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly, if I think of what impressionist has made me laugh the most, present company accepted, I, I think of, you know, when I was 12 years old, laughing insanely at Dana Carvey's impressions that really have only the barest sliver of relationship to the literal impression of a celebrity. Like, it's really like, it's at a certain point, it's like him making a weird noise that reminds you of the celebrity. Uh, yeah. Or him, like, do, like, repeatedly, you know, patting himself on top of the head, and somehow that captures the essence of Michael Caine. Uh, yeah. I was never that familiar with Dana Carvey and like, like when Wayne's World came out, like we didn't, we didn't get SNL in in the UK, you know, and and uh, that was like, what is this? This thing that was fully formed, but that was already in your conscious consciousness. As, 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 as. But I did through The Simpsons, which is one of my all time favorite things. Through The Simpsons, I discovered Phil Hartman, and it was only after he died that I got to see all his stuff, all his SNL stuff. And like, he's somebody that, he's one of my heroes, certainly. I mean, I, I think he's like, uh, you know, his approach to like impressions, you know, is always him in a way. One of my favorite things, favorite, favorite, favorite things ever. <laughs> 
the the it's on the the Phil Hartman SNL VHS Best of Phil Hartman, and it's the one where he's the drama teacher. Have you ever seen that sketch? I don't remember it off the top of my head. He's a drama teacher in a new teaching New York actors in like a loft, right? And he's clearly he's like a has been actor and teach. <laughs> he's this is one sketch. Like uh, Will Ferrell is in it, like, and he's about ten, right? And uh, Mike Myers is in it. Everyone is in it, right? And they're all like really young and like Phil. No one can keep a straight face. <laughs> <laughs> and Phil Hartman is this he's he's playing this okay right what we're going to do today is uh talking with beverages right now I'm going to tell you a story it's uh, a Hollywood story a good friend of mine very close friend of mine David Hasselhoff he calls me he says I got this scene I'm on set right now I got the scene hit my talking car is refusing to jump the canyon. I have to convince him to jump the canyon. I don't know how to do it. Can you tell me how to do it? And I say to him, I say, David, and, and he just he just does, he, he brings his hands up to his face, right? And he goes, he says, this is something, this is nothing. This is something, this is nothing. <laughs> And that's his, that's his catchphrase. That's what he, where well, it's the only bit of advice he gives. <laughs> when he get the students, they do a little bit of a scene. He says, no, 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 terrible. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Now, look, this is something, this is nothing. This is something, this is nothing. Now go, right? <laughs> and, and, and uh, yeah, that, I think that sketch has been just, has influenced so much of my comedy as an adult. He is a genius Peter Serafinowicz it's been a joy to have you on the program oh man it is lovely lovely to be on thank you for having me on Jesse it's lovely to see you Peter Serafinowicz the first season of The Tick is available to stream now on Amazon it just got picked up for a second season which should premiere next year if you haven't seen any of peter's music videos or his impressions i recommend pretty much everything but i have to say that my number one favorite thing that he has ever done is look around you and uh, if you're in the uk it's easy to find if you're in the us i think you can get it on dvd and you can certainly see highlights on youtube